Thank you so much for coming to Entergy Mississippi's uh, Integrated Resource Plan Public Workshop. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for participating in this process that the Commission has for us under Rule 29. And so today we've brought some of our um, best subject matter experts together for you to um, ask questions of, for them to talk with you about our resource planning process. And um, I'm here as Intergy Mississippi's regulatory legal counsel to answer any questions you might have about the process. And um, otherwise, I'm going to defer questions to our, our subject matter experts about resource planning. So I want to bring up Aaron Hill, who's our director of resource planning here in Mississippi, to start us off. sign-in sheet at the front, and if you don't mind on the way out, just letting us know that you were here. Uh, uh, thank you all. Um, so, uh, like uh, Alicia said, Aaron Hill, Director of Resource Planning and Market Operations for Mississippi, and excited to be here. Um, this is my first IRP cycle to fully participate in, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. I'm a little, a little nervous. Hey, hey, Sam. A little nervous here, but not necessarily because of talking in front of this uh, this audience, but more about just the life change that I got coming up later today. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a pivotal moment when I'm dropping my daughter off this afternoon. I'll be empty nest. So big changes in the Hill House today. So I'm probably more nervous about that than I am even standing up here talking in front of you guys. But um, yeah, and before you say something, Commissioner, it is Ole Miss, and I do, re I do really like Ole Miss. Really like, good school. It's good school. It's good school. It's good school. Exactly. Yeah. So really, really excited about that whole process uh, that I'm going to be um, partaking in this afternoon. So uh, we can we can jump right in uh, now. But like Alicia said, the IRP process is kicking off today. This is the workshop. It is a, a year long process that culminates in a filing next Ju July. So July 2024 will be our filing. And today's meeting will be mainly about the, the scope and the process of, of the IRP as a whole. And so, let me click the next button. I, I think I got it here, Alicia. No, this is perfect. And so, you know, just, just overall, we, we've got uh, some experts here that are backing me up. That really helps with my uh, nerves as well. So, um, and I'll introduce uh, them at a, at a little bit later time, but this is the overview of the scope that you see on the slides here, and it's uh, going to start off with just an EML overview. Move on. So, for Entergy Mississippi as a whole, so we serve about uh, 450 plus, 461,000 electric customers in Mississippi. And you see there in the green, that's our service territory. It um, it's, looks a little splotchy, but it is spread out from all the way from Memphis down to Macomb. And uh, there's transmission lines that connect all of those green areas. We have uh, 3,041 miles of high voltage transmission line. I've seen most of it personally with my background. But we've got 115,000 volts. 230,000 volts and 500 kV lines as well. And uh, also have 18,000, almost 19,000 miles of distribution line. So that's the lower voltage, 13.8 kV or 1247 uh, kV. A, a lot of distribution lines that travel uh, throughout that green area. 228 distribution substations. That's substations that step the transmission high voltage down to the 13.8 and allow it to go down the streets and eventually serve our commercial or industrial or, or residential customers. So, um, yes, sir. So, you talked about in July last year, you did a uh, mm -hmm. temperatures within the triple digits over the last several weeks. How close was the temperature? Good question. I didn't have time to even update the slide. But um, the good. Well, I believe we did. The, the process is you got like a 14-day reconciliation process here where we, you know, 14 days after the, the day, we'll get the updated numbers. Preliminarily, we crossed over the 3,000 megawatt, um, uh, 3, megawatt mark. So that would be 
one of the first times, I think since 2016. I don't believe we hit a miss EML peak, but I believe we crossed over that 3,000 mark. So, and um, that was in those triple digits we had last week. So we'll look to get that in a couple, maybe a week or so. Is that right? So. Okay. And that was a, a question just about the peak of, um, with the, the weather that we've had in the past week. It's really dry here and hot here in Mississippi right now. So um, over the past year, in 2022, 13.7 million megawatt hours of electricity. So, and um, from our generation, we control uh, 3.5 gigawatts of, of generation. And that is uh, it's the Choctaw facility, Tala facility, Hines here in, in Hines County, General Andrus, Isis, and uh, Grand Gulf. So that is uh, located uh, throughout the, the state and one located in Arkansas. So we also have the Sunflower Solar Project, which is new, that was mentioned in our mid-cycle update, and have a couple of other solar projects that are under evaluation at the um, commission uh, right now. So if there are, well, on the, on the right side here, you can see of the slide, you can see some of our capacity mix and energy mix numbers. That's, that solar is the Sunflower Solar from last year and the coal and um, nuclear and natural gas. So you can see there that we're 70% natural gas in capacity and energy about 63% there. So any questions on, on basics for an EML update? Yes, sir, Chip. Yes, sir. When was the 500 or KV system built? Good question. Um, I don't know specific answers to that, but there is a, uh, there's a couple of stations here that, that start off like in the Jackson area and it goes up to the northeast and ties to the TVA system up there. You know, that's kind of like the interstate system of, of the whole transmission infrastructure, that extremely high voltage line. And so we have a line that, that ties over to TVA and it uh, goes through Jackson straight out to the west to um, our, our sister companies to the, to the west, crosses over the Mississippi River, and also goes south and ties to Louisiana in two different places too. So that, that spider web you know, just traverses the state, kind of like the interstate system. When it was built, 60s? Uh, uh, yeah, 60s probably, you know, and, and with some, some upgrades after that, you know, the expansions after that. I know we built the, um, the Lake Over substation, which is north of Jackson there. I believe that was in, in the early 90s, but I mean, I'm, I'm really just, that, that's not before Aaron, B-A, that's not before Aaron, but it's before Aaron working here, you know what I mean? So, but yeah, good, good question. But, mm -hmm. Just on the clarification of the yes, um, capacity and energy mix from nuclear, assuming that's Grand Gulf, can you just real quick hit on how the allocation amongst the states and where Mississippi is currently at as far as the percentage it is now receiving as part of the uh, Grand Gulf disbursement. Okay. Of yeah, I, I'm, I'm not fully um, plugged into the percentages, but I do know we have 510 megawatts that we, we have counted for capacity there. And um, from, a, from this year, I mean, we, a lot of the improvements and investments that we made recently are, are are showing a, a, a good benefit because we got 99% capacity factor for 2023. So it's a very good year for Grand Gulf here that running and I really appreciate it with, it with it with the temperatures we've had and with the loading that we've had. So about 510 megawatts. But there are um, portions that are uh, allocated to other jurisdictions as well and, and other, other companies too. So, yeah. Approximately 40% for um, EMLs allocation. Um, updates since the last IRP, um, not mentioned on this slide, is EML turned 100 this year. We should have should actually put that on here. So that, that was a, a big deal, we, we, 100 years in, in April of this year. And as I was thinking about that on the way to work this morning, I wondered what that first IRP session would have looked like. You know, what, I think it was like what kind of sawdust to burn, pine tree or, or oak tree, which one burns cleaner, which one burns better, provides the most 
efficient output. But that's um, we crossed over that hundred year mark. Hope to hope to be here for the um, the next one hundred years. Although I'll be getting a little old at that point. But starting off with the the MISO resource adequate season um, SAC seasonal accreditation capacity uh, changes that that occurred not long ago with um, with MISO. That's the first thing on the list here. Uh, there's also the IRA. I know there's a lot of um, discussions around that in the industry and also in, in Entergy and uh, still making sure we fully see that um, and that's still a little bit uncertain. A lot of questions around that. The overall increases in capital costs and supply chain delays. I know everybody in all industries are dealing with, with that type of thing. So recent volatility in natural gas prices. We know that um, just the, the worldwide um, exposure to natural gas has had some, some changes there and um, continues to be a little volatile. Uh, general forms in the MISO interconnection process. Uh, some of our, our guests here will may be very familiar with that. And uh, overall, just Q process and working with MISO to refine that. Um, economic development potential in Mississippi. I know that's a, I know that's a big deal in Mississippi that we got, we got a lot of customers interested in this area and it's because we have uh, good government support, good workforce development, uh, attractive um, property, attractive transmission system. I mean, we got a lot of people looking at our area. So that continues to be a, a, a big deal. Workforce development is huge. I, I know that we joked earlier, I got Mississippi State ties. Um, also, we got Delana in here. She works in my group too as, a, as an engineer. So she's from a Jackson State grad. So, I mean, all of that's very cool. We got a good workforce development ready to, to support industry and commercial, industrial um, industry moving in here. And so we, we foresee that to be a, a big uh, plus here in the future. Mississippi's ready for, for business. Yes, sir. Yeah, Simon, Simon Mahan with Southern hey, Renewable Energy Association. I've got a, a few questions on this slide. How okay. are y'all going to model these these issues that have come up, you know, if you can kind of go bullet by bullet how you're going to model them, that, that would be helpful. Yes, um, we, we, can we uh, postpone that for for one of my um, ne yep, okay, one of my next uh, speakers? We Not can problem. maybe come back to this slide in a minute and, and look at some of that okay. as yep. fundamentals, uh, how to set that up. So do you have another question? No, I'm good. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And now just looking at the just general overall objective of this, the, like Alicia talked about, the overall planning process and framework, you know, the costs and benefits and, and uh, supply side as well as demand side uh, here. Thank you. And alternatives to develop the resource plan that, that we have, you know, inputs into that process and we'll eventually have that, that output plan uh, next year. So want to emphasize that the results of this IRP are, are not um, predetermined schedules or resource additions or you know, even discussions around deactivations. This is more of a, a strategy, uh, overall strategy. So just an overall plan here. And throughout this whole process, so there'll be studies from, from customer input focused on a 20-year planning cycle. We consider preferences and, and changes in the industry with, uh, with customer requests and, and new technologies and our portfolios um, and our long-term planning objectives. We make sure that's covered and resource adequacy requirements with MISO and internal. Also evaluate the different fuels and, and we analyze all of those portfolios under multiple different economic structures. So if there's um, any questions on that, we, I mean, we can get more detailed definitely in, in the the modeling here. So um, I know, let's see, let me make sure I covered everything. Well, we, we have, um, so uh, some of our experts will come up here and, and start talking about more of the, the modeling. Is First of all, let me introduce, we got Daniel uh, Brodko with, he's a manager of supply planning and analysis group for Entergy, supporting Entergy Mississippi. And Jonathan Alvis is the manager of power development group. So they'll be covering some of this, these IRP objective bullets here. So Daniel Baratko and Jonathan Alvis. 
So any, any questions, I'll, I'll turn it over to um, Daniel here and, and be, be available for any dis questions or discussions at a later point. Y'all hear me all right? Testing. Okay, thanks, Aaron. All right, so on this slide, this is just a, a high-level overview of the stages of the process here. So we're kind of we're in the inputs and assumptions and development of future stage of this process right now. We haven't run the models. Um, once we get to running the models, the metric, we'll talk about that, total relevant supply cost. That's kind of our metric that we use to gauge you know, the portfolios that come out of this process, the cost to Entergy Mississippi customers of those portfolios. Um, we'll talk about the risk assessment um, qualitatively and quantitatively, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the, the IRP reports and overall schedule at the end of this. Okay, so, you know, at a very high level, of course, when we talk about resource planning, you know, the most important thing is that we're balancing several objectives here. Um, the, so when we, when we talk about the modeling, um, you know, the reliability aspect is, is key. So there's an industry standard of 0 0.1 days per year, LOLE, that makes its way into the models, translates into reserve margin requirements, et cetera. When we do the modeling, that is, you know, kind of a, a hard constraint, right? The model really tries to, to add enough capacity uh, to make sure that the system is meeting that reliability requirement at the lowest cost. And then when we look at the portfolios, especially qualitatively, we also try to consider um, you know, environmental stewardship and risk, uh, especially if there's components of the modeling aspects that, you know, aren't perfectly captured um, in the software algorithms, right? So we're qualitatively looking at the portfolios that come out, and then some pieces of risk are, are measured within the futures process that, that Aaron mentioned. So at, at a high level, that's, you know, this is, a, again, a strategy slide talking about the objectives and the trade-offs. So jumping a little bit into the analytical framework, we'll spend some time just explaining what this slide is. This is, you know, the um, load and capability assessment. It's really the assessment of resource need that we use to put the inputs into the model to figure out what are we asking the model to solve for. Uh, so this is a depiction of, you know, the blue line and the orange line are sort of the capacity deficit uh, stated in this chart on an annual basis. We can talk about, once we baseline on this, we can talk about the MISO seasonal construct, how that plays into this. Um, the bars that are stacking up against it are in the legend. Those are the Mississippi's um, solar resources that we mentioned earlier in the presentation that are before the commission now. Uh, so those are kind of, you know, baked into the process. So the model isn't, you know, dis determining whether or not it's more economic to do something else versus the resources we already have pending for certification in the commission. Um, the large increases in the deficit are due to the deactivations that we've stated in the top left, so Gerald Andrus and Independence deactivations that are assumed 2027 and 2030. So those create large capacity needs, and that's part of this exercise here is um, making sure that the model gives us the, you know, some strategic information about what types of resources would be most economic to reliably meet, you know, EML's customer needs uh, given those deactivations, creating that capacity need. Uh, and then the, the chart on the bottom. Uh, the table on the bottom is just a numerical representation of that deficit. So as you can see, it grows over time, you know, a little bit of load growth, but also mainly driven by the deactivations. Yes, Simon. Yeah, on the chart, what's the orange in the bars? I think the legend might have gotten cut off. That's, I believe, referring to distributed generation, including the power through program. Okay, and where's the, um, you you all have a, a thousand megawatt of solar currently out for bid. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, we're, so if it's not a, a resource that's pending certification, it's not kind of baked into the analysis. Okay, if it, if it were to be included in here, how, how, when would that come online and what would happen to that orange, uh, to the orange line? So the orange line, sorry, we're getting some. They can't hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do, I'm going to answer your question, but I kind of want to wait until. Yeah, no, absolutely. Here. Okay. So 
the orange line would would stay where it is. There would simply be you know a representation of the capacity from those megawatts that would stack up as a planned resource, similar to the other ones that are there in the legend. Got the it. magnitude of that would, of course, be equal to the accredited capacity assumption we have for that chunk of, of megawatts. Got it. And so the orange line the, uh, in 2027, the deficit isn't 550 megawatts. It's 550 megawatts minus the 210-ish. So That's right. It's, it's closer to 300 or something like that. That's right. Yeah, got it. Okay. Yeah. What's the uh, uh, life expectancy of the CCGTs uh, now? So, so new build CCGTs kind of in the modeling world are... That are running like Heinz and Metalla. What's the life expectancy? So those, we have specific deactivation assumptions based on the life that was a result of kind of a service hours assessment, um, some engineering assessments of those units. Generically, 30 years. I, don't, I mean, I don't know off the top of my head how many, like what the actual, you know, is it 37 or is it 41, but we can, uh, you know. You have to pick a number. I think I uh, said last one, 30 years. That, that's right. The generic assumption is 30 years, but in this in this planning horizon, those, those units are assumed to remain online. This is a 20-year analysis, so over the 20-year period, we're looking at here, planning for those facilities to remain online. I know. It, it, I guess it's on. Yeah, in your uh, the assumed deactivation to Gerald Andrews and Independence, what other factors in play that may move those assumptions forward or back any direction? Are there matters that are being considered in this that could push it forward or back a considerable amount that um, would? help reduce the capacity need component? Not that we're evaluating now, no. Those are assumptions that we plan to fix and hold in the analysis. Okay. Especially when we talk about accelerating deactivations with the challenges currently getting, you know, we've talked about the cost pressures and the op lack of optionality with the MISO queue reforms going on right now, putting a pause on the interconnection queue. Um, I think it's important that we take a measured approach in terms of the risk of modifying those assumptions vis-a-vis -vis getting new generation online. Okay. Actually, I did want to make one more, just because well, we're going to get into some of these details on subsequent slides. The reserve margins that we're talking about here and that are quoted on the top, these are annual reserve margins. They're the results of a previous analytical study that we did where we looked at MISO's last reserve margin before they moved to the seasonal construct and kind of did our own internal analysis to figure out how do we risk adjust that for the period it takes us to plan for new generation to come online, taking into account uncertainties and load forecast, et cetera. So this is a, you know, a coincident peak unforced capacity reserve margin that's a little bit higher than what MISO required at the point in time when we developed that. But that just wanted to cover the basis for that reserve margin to level set on that so that if we get into details about seasonal, et cetera, that we have the right you know, uh, common baseline to, to talk about that from. Okay. So in terms of some of the key inputs into the model, um, these are listed out here. Of course, we, you know, the software we're using is Aurora to conduct a capacity expansion analysis. Uh, the load forecast is a key input. Um, in the notice, we talked about, you know, the timeline here providing us the ability to use the latest assumptions and data, that's going to include, you know, for example, the load forecast that's submitted to MISO, uh, you know, towards the end of the year in November for their module E process, as well as kind of our general updates to all of our assumptions in terms of generator ratings, um, you know, any information we might get around, um, you know, MISO's ongoing stakeholder process. All of those are, you know, inputs into the model. Um, mentioned the capacity accreditation, that's an ongoing uh, effort in MISO, there's a piece of it that's already approved by FERC, and there's a piece that's still pending and isn't planned to be implemented for, until five years from now, so we necessarily have some risk around what that, what form that ends up taking, but of course those are inputs into the model, it has, it's a 20-year analysis, needs to figure out how are we going to accredit capacity over that, over that period. Um, you know, the, the existing fleet capability, again, kind of the SAC ratings for Intergy Mississippi's existing units. Um, 
we talked about the resource deactivation assumptions, uh, our generic point of view on new build technologies, you know, what's the megawatts, what's the cost, heat rate, fixed and variable O&M, et cetera, operating life for new build resources. Those are key inputs into the model. Um, Jonathan will talk a little bit about those technologies later. Um, DSM, so energy efficiency and demand response programs um, that Entergy Mississippi has, of course, those will reduce the energy and overall capacity need. Uh, so that's an input into the model as well. And then we talk about the economic and financial implications and inputs, you know, inflation, um, you know, EML's capital structure, which helps dictate, you know, the, the costs and the discount rate that we use in the analysis, uh, as well as obviously macroeconomic assumptions about our natural gas, you know, coal prices, nuclear cost, um, you know, IRA, uh, we talked about tax credits uh, for PTCs, ITCs, as well as, um, you know, any, uh, right now we have, you know, the good neighbor rule recently, federal implementation plan with Knox price risk, as well as our point of view internally on uh, CO2 price risk across the various scenarios. So again, high level just review and kind of high, you know, very impactful inputs into the model here. Just any questions on this? Do, do I ask my capacity accreditation questions now, or do I? Do Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Go for it. What capacity accreditation values are you all thinking about using, uh, given the seasonal uh, accreditation capacity changes? Yeah. So, so we've got. We're, we're currently in the late stages of an internal ELCC study that looks at, you know, a number of different scenarios around combinations within MISO South and MISO, kind of with the regional directional transfer on and off to kind of figure out what's appropriate for MISO South versus all of MISO. But it's, it's a comprehensive study that we're working on and is going to be available for us to use to inform the inputs for this analysis when we're actually running it. So it'll be to more towards the end of the year. Um, and that'll include, you know, some of the dynamic kind of interactive effects around if you have this much solar and this much wind, how do they help create additional reliability headroom and energy storage as well, and how do those all interact and interplay with one another. Great. Are, are you going to include the ELCC study in the, the report that you'll file next year so folks can take a look at it? Yeah, that's the intent. Yeah, like to have a, a write-up of it as well as, you know, when we have the technical conference, maybe some breakdown of values that are actually within some charts and stuff, but an accompanying report that we, I imagine, would be provided with the IRP as well. Great. Uh, thank you. And then you mentioned the, the regional directional transfer between the north and the south affecting the, the ELCC study. How are you all modeling the RDT or thinking about the RDT with regards to other components in the integrated resource planning process? Yeah, so there's in the ELCC, uh, so first of all, I'll say we haven't made final decisions on this. These are things that we're thinking about. What, what's the right method to go with here, but I can talk about generally, you know, we, there's a difference between maybe what we might decide to use when we're talking about the capacity credit assumptions versus when we do the production cost modeling. I think we would, you know, we model all of MISO, and in that case, we would intend to, to model the RDT. But when MISO runs their models, it's a copper sheet for their LOLE analysis, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to work through the trade-offs now between how closely do we, you know, mimic and, and have symmetry with MISO studies versus if we have a different point of view, maybe on what the reliability impact should be for the South, given that that actually is a constraint in actual operations. So, I, th I mean, I think that what I'm saying is there's maybe a difference between production cost modeling and the kind of capacity accreditation study. Um, and we may or may not, you know, have this, the same assumption there, but that's something we're working through and, and thinking about. Well, I'll just mention the, the more clarity that you all can, can provide in the report regarding how the RDT is modeled or not in various components of the IRP, that would be very helpful. Okay. Yeah, and if you have specific items that you want to, you know, please provide those in the comments for today's meeting so we can make sure to, uh, you know, address those and when we do the modeling and, and have the technical conference. All right. Thanks. Hey, just real quick. So early on, prior to we moving this, you know, uh, Mr. Aaron stepped through several things that he identified since the last RP as being, you know, considerable shifts in the market and things to be considered. What do y'all really considered as really the top line issues of greater great concern as you 
enter into the next cycle of RRB, RRP planning? What are those top line market shifts that um, could potentially have a significant push or pull on your IRP development going forward beyond that list? I would say Inflation Reduction Act, load growth, potential, MISO seasonal construct. Those are right off the bat some of the biggest ones. And some of those pull in different directions. Um, also just, you know, general changes to uh, cost for resources on a go-forward basis. Does that help? Okay. Sure. Okay, so just a little bit on the load forecast process. Talked about that's a key input. Um, you know, I'm not, full disclosure, I'm not the SME for load forecasting. I do know a bit about it and I can describe it, but um, you know, generally the, the process is a regression model for everything other than large industrial customers. The data that we get into the load forecasting process for large industrials is from our uh, economic development team. But the regression models look at you know, um, trending uh, and applying the coefficients from that analysis to future projections and trying to map load shapes onto that. So it starts out with you know, sales and load volumes and then try to figure out by customer class what load shapes do we think are appropriate based on the relationship between you know, those, those subsectors and customer classes and usage on a, in a recent historical basis and kind of applying that forward. So it's a, you know, a general regression of, uh, approach for everything other than large industrial. Um, in terms of some of the other inputs, apart from just the overall regression models, of course, we look at uh, organic energy efficiency, right? Somebody without an incentive or a utility program decides to go replace their refrigerator, that's gonna result in lower energy usage, but also operating company sponsored DSM uh, from EMLs programs and from potential study from the last IRP cycle, uh, which we'll talk about as well. Any questions on just the general load forecasting process? Can you give a general sense of how the company is evaluating uh, your load forecast over time? Do you have a, a general percentage in mind of how much you think it's going up, both on an energy basis and an on capacity basis that you can share? So the data that we're going to use for this is going to be the next kind of annual internal refresh cycle for our assumptions. So I don't have those you know, peak load coincident and non-coincident numbers from that forecast today being developed as we speak uh, for the next kind of an annual cycle of, of input assumptions. But I can tell you that, you know, some of the factors like EV penetration, for example, those are in the forecast and they affect the back end. And you're talking about the business plan 2024, right? That's the internal nomenclature that we use, yeah, regarding the kind of refresh cycle for assumptions. And that'll get put together in December or so? Yeah, pieces of it are being worked on now. I kind of mentioned the demand forecast piece and it, there's a, you know, a, a multi-month kind of internal process given the extent of that. It's, it's, it's really informing the financial forecast too, so it's pretty, it's an elongated process. But the model runs that form kind of the base scenario case that we evaluate the IRP on top of are really towards the end of the year. That's kind of an overall timeline. And is, are there other sort of large-scale growth opportunities that you all are thinking about? Uh, hydrogen production, uh, if there's... Uh, liquid natural gas uh, additions that are going to be happening, or, or is it really just the electric vehicles that you think is going to drive the load change over time? Yeah, so I, I don't have those details, but certainly, you know, large industrial growth is something that the economic development team looks at, and that will be, you know, evident in our, in our next forecast if, you know, we'll be able to talk in more details about that at that point in time when we actually have the, the forecast completed and the data. Okay, thanks. Okay, so on the next slide, uh, we talked about the background for the load forecasting process. This slide describes, you know, some of the um, levers, if you will, or the methodology regarding kind of the alternate scenarios that are developed in the IRP process to model the different futures, which is the approach that we use to, you know, test kind of bookends for 
um, you know, different market assumptions, different load forecasts. Of course, and when it comes to EML planning to meet its capacity needs, you know, some of these factors, obviously the load forecast could impact what the size of that deficit is that we talked about on the load and capability slide that we would plan to, uh, to solve for in the models. And so while we don't have those scenarios fully defined now, because of course we're still kind of in the process of getting the new forecast and the data all updated, uh, this slide describes, you know, some of the, um, you know, just the general process and kind of depicts it on the bottom right there in terms of, you know, like a reference forecast versus low and high. All right, so I touched on demand side management potential. Um, the last ICF potential study that was conducted for the prior IRP uh, email is going to use that still. We think those, those study results are relevant still. And we're going to be modeling those potential programs and you know, the impact they have on the load shape, the energy requirements for EML, as well as the, the peak load contribution I will be included in the Aurora modeling that I've been talking about thus far as well as any OPCO-sponsored DSM, meaning actual programs that are being uh, invested in and executed on now. Of course, we'll have to you know, take a look at what came out of the study, what we've executed on, and true up those, and make sure that we're modeling you know, what's, what's actually being funded and executed on, and also the, the additional potential from the last IRP cycle. On the DSM, the um, ICF study was attached to last cycle's IRP. And so since we're using the same one, all the details on the DSM is already out there and it's in the stocket. So if y'all want to look at that, it was attached as a public attachment to last cycle's IRP. Okay, next slide. All right, so I, I briefly touched on the, the futures developments and kind of the, the purpose for them uh, to create bookend scenarios and look at the risk for how portfolios change uh, that come out of the modeling exercise depending on uh, you know, what future we're modeling, what load growth we have, what gas, CO2 prices, et cetera, what other policy changes might be modeled in those futures. Um, and there's a, a bullet point list here. I'm not gonna read every single one. I think I've touched kind of a lot on uh, at least you know, at a high level talking about the impact that each one of those will have. Um, but if there are particular questions about, about those, now would be a good time to, to, to address those. Um, but in any case, again, the Aurora capacity expansion model is going to output the same thing. It's going to try to figure out how to meet the reliability needs at the lowest reasonable cost, uh, given the capacity need that's dictated um, in each of these scenarios, according, and also taking into account the economics of the energy production given the gas prices, CO2 prices, et cetera, uh, that are modeled in those scenarios. Yeah, can you kind of talk through the different futures that you all are thinking about putting together? Is it similar to the last cycle or is it going to be different? How many futures are, are you going to look at? Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I'll caveat and say it's not finalized, but I can say that, you know, more than two, probably less than five, try to keep it limited um, so that we have, uh, you know, a feasible number of scenarios to, to work through. That's kind of the, that's not a firm plan, again, but that's something that we would expect. Um, go ahead. No, that's where is a gas hedging uh, programs in this? So we're not modeling fuel hedging as part of the IRP assessment. That's a strategic, you know, fuel supply and procurement strategy. It's a whole team that, that works on that outside of the IRP process. Is it publicized anywhere? Not that I'm aware of. I think publishing our fuel hedging strategy might, you know, harm customers. Um, can you 
So back back on the future development, uh, is one of the futures that you all are thinking about going to be a decarbonization scenario for the company to meet the company's carbon goals? So it is an intergy goal, not an EML goal, but we will consider, you know, what's the CO2 intensity rate for the portfolio as a metric. And there's a uh, discussion of that as well in the risk assessment slides later. Um, but that's the short answer. So we're not, you know, it, it's, it's not something that we currently plan to say. It's also a 2050 goal, and this is a 20-year analysis, and there's a significant amount of uncertainty on the back end of what the technologies look like and when they'll be available and what their operating parameters will be and costs will be. Um, so recognizing that in the near term, there's a lot more fidelity on these modeling assumptions for uh, proven commercially scalable renewable technologies like solar, wind, and battery storage. Um, so I, I, I don't have a you know, final answer or firm answer for you on if there's going to be a specific scenario for that, but it's definitely something that we're uh, considering. And then on the, the market unit life assumptions, are you talking about the MISO market life assumptions or uh, EMLs? Uh, talking about the, the market. So when we do the capacity expansion modeling and, and we refer to market, generally that means that, you know, it's the MISO market minus Entergy Mississippi. Right. Yeah. And so... Uh, th there's kind of two components of that, right? So you've got the existing generation units in the MISO market and then any potential new units that the model might add for capacity expansion. And so how how are you thinking about the life assumptions for the existing fleet within MISO and then uh, for the new technologies that, that are, well, the, the new generation units that will be added because of the capacity expansion? Are they are they similar or are they, are they the same? So like like what Chip was asking before, a combined cycle natural gas unit, I think you all assumed it, it'd be around for 30 years. Are you making that assumption for existing generation in the MISO market and then new generation that'll be added through capacity expansion? Yeah, that, that's right. So it varies by technology, right? But for new, in the example that you just gave, that our assumption for new build gas resources is a 30-year useful life. Do you, do you happen to know the other technologies that you'll provide to the model, just kind of off the top of your head? Solar and wind will be, Jonathan can give more details, okay. but generally 30 years for solar and wind as well. Energy storage, 20 years. And then in the MISO market, um, I, you know, I think Independence and White Bluff are kind of are examples of this where we, we know of certain retirement dates of certain facilities in the MISO market and so they're coal units, just for example. And so if you assign a 50-year life for coal units in the MISO market, but they might be retiring sooner than that 50-year lifespan, how, how are you going to kind of uh, juxtapose those, those differences if there are differences? Right. So for coal units, we're not modeling new build coal as an option sure. for capacity expansion. So that's, that takes care of that issue. Um, for EMLs, you know, existing units and for the affiliate units that there are public settlements for, obviously, like the White Bluff units, you know, we're, we're modeling the deactivation dates that are based on those settlements. And in Intergy's Louisiana's IRP for some of the other market units that are affiliate but market to EML in this process, there's, you know, deactivation assumptions that are listed explicitly for those coal units specifically in their IRP. Um, and we have symmetry in our modeling assumptions across for, for the energy units. When we talk about the market, that's a lever that we plan to look at for, you know, existing unit life for existing coal, like the remaining coal in MISO North, for example, could be highly impactful to the modeling. So we may have a scenario that, you know, deactivates that earlier than our generic useful life assumption, for example. And that'll be, you know, explicitly stated on the, uh, as an assumption for that future um, when we present those. Yep, th that'll be helpful. Um, and then on the, the federal tra tax credit component, um, how are you modeling the, in the Inflation Reduction Act and how are you in incorporating that into the analysis? Or is that a Jonathan question? No, I, I mean, I can address it. Okay. So for solar and wind, we're modeling the PTCs, assuming that prevailing wage requirements are met. But we're not making an assumption about, and with a forward inflation adjustment, right, because that's built into the mechanism um, with a, the uh, actual legislation there. Um, in terms of 
battery storage with modeling and ITC. And let's see. There's an existing nuclear PTC. I don't have the details on that one uh, for you today. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then on the demand side, because there are uh, tax credits, at least for consumers, from the Inflation Reduction Act for things like electric vehicles or heat pumps, uh, are, and uh, are you taking consideration in, uh, the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act on the load? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I don't have the details on that, but I, I, I believe that's embedded in the sales and load forecasting process in terms of how it affects, for example, organic energy efficiency um, and other measures like that. Okay. And then the generation, and this is the second to last bullet, the generation capital cost forecast, is that a you or, John, can I ask generally where those numbers are coming from? It's, Jonathan can cover it. Okay. Uh, it's a variety of sources that we look at. And then the market reforms that MISO is conducting, it's, it's more specifically like the seasonal uh, accreditation uh, component that you're, look that you're talking about with that, right? Yeah, the existing, the, the, for the thermal units, right, we have a approved, FERC approved, um, you know, MISO's changes for that. So we, while we, while we expect volatility around that, and that's been stated in our public comments on the, uh, to FERC on this issue, on a go-forward basis, the non-thermal reforms is really the majority of what we're talking about there. There's still a significant amount of uncertainty on uh, what exactly the mechanics of that are going to be, although with our internal ELCC study, we think we'll be well positioned to be able to, you know, forecast what MISO will eventually impose in terms of accreditation, although that currently isn't being planned to be implemented until 2028. So that's that's why we feel like we need the study to be able to, it's five years from now, that's the planning horizon, right? It doesn't right. do us any good if we don't have any point of view on that. We wait for MISO and then we figure out we're short. Yeah, right, right. So, and, and um, th there's no, uh, other way to ask this, are you all going to be assuming that you'll stay in the MISO market for the next 20 years, or are you going to do some sort of analysis about potentially leaving MISO at some point? It, we're not planning a scenario where we're exiting MISO okay. currently. All right, thanks. Okay. So I, I touched on the metric at the front end of this presentation. Uh, and as well as the software tool, right? So Aurora is our capacity expansion, optimization, model, and production cost tool. Um, you know, what, what comes out of that model is just a point of view on the variable cost for Intergy Mississippi, including the existing units, how they dispatch and run, and how the new units that were selected out of the capacity expansion analysis, how they run, and how all that interacts. So that piece goes into what we're calling total relevant supply cost. The other pieces of that metric are you know, the fixed cost of those generation alternatives, the fixed cost of the demand side management energy efficiency programs. Um, so all of those fixed costs for new generation and demand side management get coupled together with the simulated variable cost in the market. And that's kind of our, our metric for what's relevant to this analysis. The key piece that's excluded from that is you know, the embedded costs that are in rates today for existing generation. We're not doing analysis that determines whether or not that doesn't play into it. It's not, you know, relevant in terms of the metric that we're looking at on a go-forward basis. So this, again, this slide is just to define and kind of baseline what the, you know, economic metric is that we're using to gauge the cost effectiveness of the portfolios for EML customers. And the next slide is a visual depiction of that, um, just in case, you know, my description didn't kind of hit home. There's a graphical representation of it here. So again, uh, variable supply costs within the context of the MISO market, fixed costs for DSM and new generation alternatives, and then the total relevant supply cost is the total cost metric. Okay. So I talked about the risk assessment here. There's just a, a kind of a laundry list of factors that we look at um, and a little bit of detail on each one and how they are, um, you know, how we think about each of these metrics. So market risk, um, you know, of course we don't, Intergy Mississippi in, the, in this process with capacity expansion, we're planning to meet a capacity need, but we do also look at how much energy is being produced by 
Intergy Mississippi is under contracted resources relative to its demand as a measure of risk. If you're short, you're exposed to the market. If you're long, you're relying on the market to make those uh, ec make those investments economically justified for customers. So there's risk on, on, on either side of kind of your generation relative to your actual demand in the MISO market. Um, when we talk about when we talk about reliability, um, you know, on the front end of this process, sort of the LOLE studies and the technical analysis that go into the reserve margins um, and the accreditation values, that's not, you know, a direct, it's an indirect way to, to get at how reliable are the portfolios. Um, we're considering, you know, looking at the results in light of, okay, if we have modeling techniques that use these inputs and then we model the outputs and assess them, how is that compared to what we assumed on the input side? So we're just, uh, you know, kind of a, a metric that we look at. The overall kind of age of the fleet, of course, modernizing the fleet is an important kind of aspect of the genera generation planning process. So we don't want to rely on, you know, excessively old generation. Those have, a, you know, prone to higher rates of failure and higher forced added traits, et cetera. And we know in the MISO construct now, that's very important that our units are able to offer energy when they're needed most. Trade-offs between execution, executability and optionality are something that we think about. So if we have a tremendous amount of optionality for maybe more modular resources that we plan to add, that's inherently a good thing. We can make adjustments as we go and get better information about what our demand might be. However, that's a lot of resources to you know, negotiate commercial arrangement, arrangements around, bring to the commission. And so there's some trade-offs there in terms of how executable portfolios are, um, how many solicitations, et cetera versus, uh, you know, optionality, so. Fuel supply diversity, um, you know, of course, when we talk about the future scenarios, uh, if we have a scenario with a high gas price and the fleet is, you know, either very gas heavy or not very gas heavy, of course, that comes out in the analysis. Um, so it's just kind of a call out here to, you know, fuel supply diversity is something that we see as a positive um, hedge for email customers. And then environmental. Um, so to the extent that we have, you know, CO2 prices modeled and various scenarios around that, portions of that are captured in the analysis. Um, but we'll have to think about, you know, pending legislation. Uh, I talked about the good neighbor plan, and then we have proposed changes to 111 B and D as well that we'll have to consider when we develop the features in the modeling. Okay. So I think Jonathan is going to come up and talk about the screening process and the technologies. Hi, uh, Jonathan Alvis. I work in Intergy's Power Development Organization. Um, so Daniel talked about how his group uh, conducts uh, the, or, um, utilizes the Aurora capacity expansion model to help identify the lowest cost resources to serve the system's need reliably. And uh, the role of our group is to help provide him some of the inputs that will allow him to conduct that analysis, specifically on the generation side. So, um, so what we do is, is provide him a lot of the, the cost uh, inputs and to cost and operational inputs for the different resources uh, that they would utilize in, those, in that capacity expansion model. And in order to provide those costs, uh, the, the cost and operational input data, we have to conduct a screening analysis to figure out, okay, well, what resources would be appropriate to include in that model? And so um, that screening process that we do is takes into account, kind of first starts out evaluating what's the, the world, what's the spectrum of resources that are out there available that we could potentially utilize in our portfolio. And then we um, utilize some different considerations to try to figure out, okay, well, what's the, what's the right parameter or what's the right set of resources that we should consider I know that's based on the, the items that you can see over here listed. So items like how, how mature is the technology? Um, what's the cost of the technology relative to other alternatives? Um, what's the reliability of the technology? Is it feasible in our, in our region, uh, particularly uh, geographic feasibility? Is, it, uh, is, is there adequate fuel in the region? Um, and then environmental impact is another important consideration. Uh, you can see uh, on the table a lot of the technologies that were considered. Um, the ones that are um, outlined in red are the ones that are um, being provided to, to Daniel, that will be provided to Daniel's group for their analysis. Include some of your traditional rotating generation, combustion turbines, combined cycles, air derivatives, 
um, reciprocating internal combustion engines, excuse me. Um, and then we've also got um, solar resources, wind resources, and then your lithium ion batteries for, for storage. Um, I think there was a question about um, you know, how, do we, how do we pull some of the price data. That's largely uh, um, dependent upon independent uh, uh, consult or really both public and uh, kind of third part uh, third party consultant data. So that would be based on like your I or your NRAILs of the world, um, some of your IHSs. We, um, in some cases, we pulled data from Wood McKenzie, um, uh, a variety of different sources. Um, there's also a company called Level Ten, which uh, evaluates. Um, where it's I would kind of consider it the eBay of of um, of, of uh, virtual PPAs uh, pricing. We also have to take a look at that um, to compare from, from where we think the market is. Um, and then I would say for the uh, for the rotating generation, uh, we largely work with a uh, independent owner's engineer to try to identify uh, what what we think the EPC cost of a resource would be. And then make, making sure that we are including other items like interconnection costs, financing costs, uh, items like that. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, that, that's really helpful. I, I do have another question. Um, well, a few other questions. Um, so you all aren't going to model hydrogen offshore wind, SMRs, or carbon capture sequestration. Can you kind of talk through uh, your justification for excluding those technologies? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, uh, you might have to remind me of the different ones that you mentioned. I would say, if, if, if I heard all the ones, for the ones that I think I heard, um, we are, so working in our power development organization, that is something that we're actively focused on. But in terms of the more near-term generation additions, we're trying to identify things that we feel like are you know, economic and we can actually transact on soon. I would say with, with, with hydrogen, the first one that you asked about, um, I would say that the two um, areas that we're, Closely following with that are cost. You know the the hydrogen the um, Inflation Reduction Act provides the three dollar kilogram PTCs for green hydrogen. It's something that we're interested in. Um, we feel like we still feel like there are some cost challenges with hydrogen. The other uh, important aspect is infrastructure availability. Uh, I think it's like ninety or ninety five percent of the the nation's uh, hydrogen infrastructure is along the Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast. So to the extent that some of that infrastructure comes up in the Mississippi. That could um, help with the uh, with incorporating it. I would say on hydrogen, there's some really important considerations around the level of infrastructure that you have for to enable load following. So I think sometimes when people quote the price of hydrogen, they they quote, they quote the production price of hydrogen and not the delivered price of hydrogen. Um, and there's a there's a huge difference between a, an off taker that's in a power generation facility and a power off taker that's an industrial customer. Um, so that's something we're following. We feel like there's a significant infrastructure build-up that needs to happen if, in order for us to reliably run our, our resources on hydrogen, but we're hopeful on the technology. I would say also we have a joint development agreement with, with Mitsubishi Power. We've looked at uh, uh, hydrogen capability as well. Their marketing, they actually just delivered to uh, or a uh, hydrogen-capable turbine in Utah at their, at, their, um, at their facility out there, to, and they're actually going to be co-firing hydrogen there. Uh, on car, on uh, CCS, that's something that we're actively considering as well, given the enhanced 45Q tax credits uh, from the IRA. Um, Mississippi does have adequate geology for um, carbon capture. Uh, I think it's just a matter of um, trying to. Um, it's, it's a it's a matter of. Uh, I, I guess with that one, it, it's it's. Um, part of it may be due to cost. Um, the the tax credits may not fully cover the cost of of, of carbon capture, um, and then I would say also there that um, uh, you, I think we would um, we would need good partners here in Mississippi for that. I think there's a lot of interest right now in carbon capture along that Texas, Louisiana, Gulf Coast, along those you know Houston, Beaumont, Lake Charles, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, New Orleans industrial clusters where you can kind of create carbon capture or sequestration hubs. Uh, I think we're, in, we're, you know, the economic development team in bringing in more industrials in the Mississippi region may help to create some CCS sequestration hubs, which might bring the cost scale down on, on CCS. What were the other ones that you mentioned? Uh, small modular reactors and offshore wind. Yes. So small modular reactors, we have looked at that. It's public that we have a, 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 a kind of a joint um, 
uh, interest in, in uh, SMRs with Holtec. We've evaluated that. Um, I would say we, there's kind of two distinctions on SMRs. There's your light water SMRs and your non-light water SMRs, so like your new scales, your whole text that are um, focused on the light water SMRs. We are, I mean, it, it, it's a great technology. We're just waiting on the cost to, to get to the a price point that we feel like would be affordable. Um, uh, you know, affordability is a huge focus for, for our customers. Um, um, so that would, I would say really with SMRs, at least, or at least for light water SMRs, that's the price point. Uh, Non-light water SMRs, you know, there's a lot of efficiency enhancements, um, you know, you're with the uh, uh, high temperature gas reactors, molten salt reactors. Um, we have, we are interested in those. Um, there are, you know, there are in interesting um, partnerships. A lot of those folks um, are, um, are um, talking to a lot of industrials in the region to look at cogeneration for steam, for example. We are interested in the technology. It's just a matter of trying to see the commercialization of the technology advance. To the point to where we feel um, we feel comfortable with it, um, and as, once again, it's kind of more of a for at least the IRP focus in terms of near-term transactability, and maybe not necessarily trying to be an exact first mover on the technology. We would like to see kind of the the kinks worked out before we transact on it. I would, but I would say, I would say definitely with SMRs, we're hopeful that the cost curve will come down because it could be a game changer for the industry. But um, like I said, affordability is key. And then offshore wind. Offshore wind, same thing. Affordability is key. I would say two two considerations around that. One is well, yes, affordability. Um, two is there's a is is resiliency. Um, you know, Louisiana's had multiple uh, hurricanes between with Ida, Hurricane Laura, uh, hit the Gulf Coast. Um, I believe both of those were Category Five wind speeds before they made landfall. Went back down to Category Four. I'd be wrong. So that's something that we've been asking uh, original equipment manufacturers of is, okay, well, what is your wind speed ratings for these facilities? You know, we don't want a disaster where a Category 5 hurricane comes through, knocks out the infra infrastructure there, uh, and we're, uh, and so we're, we're active, we are talking to OEMs to try to make sure that the technology can withstand those wind speeds. You know, you see a lot of, you see some investments happening on the Northeast, but they don't get Category 5, hur Category 4, Category 5 hurricanes in the Northeast. So it, it's more um, adequate for the technology out there. Um, and then the other thing, like I said, with offshore wind is, is cost. We are hopeful that the cost curve will come down, but it has to come down. And then on the lithium ion batteries, are, are you all just in the modeling? Are you assuming a four hour battery or are you tinkering with different durations? I know for sure we're assuming a four hour battery. I believe that's the extent of it. Okay. And then for, sorry, <laughs> and then on the last one, I promise. Um, on the solar and wind resources, are you assuming a Mississippi-based resource or a MISO South resource or some other geography? Um, I would say for the cost, uh, so these are just kind of, well, uh, are you saying a Mississippi-based in terms of how we price it out? Yeah, the, okay. the price and the performance. Yeah, I would say largely the methodology for price is just kind of a generic MISO South um, resource. Um, uh, I would say, um, yeah, I would I would say it's a generic MISO South resource. Okay. For the uh, needs, will it be? Uh, I'm sorry. For the East needs, uh, supplies needs, resource mm -hmm. needs, will it be R RFPs and also all resource uh, included with in the RFP? So I'm not the RFP guy. Um, uh, I would defer to DML on those questions on that question. Chip, is your question about how we're going to go about procuring these resources? That um, so I mean the IRP process is obviously very different than our specific resource procurement process. It's set up to have. Um, you know, us look at what we need with supply, and then we have a separate process that the Rule 29 rule talks about, you know, for CCNs. And so when it's, um, when it's appropriate, we're going to do, do RFPs, like the ones that we've done recently for that 1,000 megawatts of, of renewable resources. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I don't know what the specific plans are for additional RFPs, but I think that the, the last two have been... Um, you know, conducted really well, and, and we've been able to see what the market is offering. And so um, the 
you know, subsequent RFPs will also be, you know, publicly, you know, available and um, marketed as, as much as we can. We're, we're very aggressive when we, when we put out those RFPs and reaching out to everybody that we can who we think might be interested. We're very proactive in, in trying to get out to the market to get participation in those, um, you know. And, and that is, again, separate than the CIRP process, but, you know, happy to provide whatever information I can about this. Yeah. Any more questions about this slide? Okay. Uh, on the next slide, so um, Entergy has publicly committed, Entergy Corp has publicly committed to net zero emissions by the year 2050. Um, and uh, this uh, chart or table, whatever you want to call it, is a screenshot from our uh, climate report that was our latest climate report that was published in November 2022. Uh, I'd encourage you to go read it if you're interested in, in some of the aspects of this. Uh, you know, some folks ask us, well, you know, how could you get, you know, how are you going to get to net zero? Well, there are technologies that we have identified that can, you know, be potential pathways to net zero. Obviously, we're not trying to get out of the IRP process here. This is just kind of a illustrative, you know, uh, potential pathway that we could get there uh, to where we would. Uh, have a line of sight into into achieving it. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know your your near term commercial resources are um, are interesting with you know solar, wind. Uh, you know, we, yeah, there was the question about gas with hydrogen capability, um, and then existing storage. You know, nuclear is, is really important to, to to stay online, zero um, carbon emissions there. And then I would say, and then and you know, to your questions about. SMRs and carbon capture. Um, as we see the commercialization of these technologies and uh, continue, we feel like, and as the particularly as the cost curve on these things come down, we've, we're hopeful that we'll be able to, to uh, affordably take advantage of this, some of these technologies and incorporate them into the um, into the portfolio. Obviously, following the IRP process and a stakeholder engagement, but uh, we do we are hopeful that some of these technologies will will advance to the point to where we feel comfortable transacting. And then, obviously, you know, something new could come along that could totally change this. So um, we're, we're keeping our eyes open, constantly following the market. We have people knocking on our door all the time, trying to talk to us about new technologies that we talk to. Um, so we're trying to stay ahead of the game on this. Yeah. Um, so. I get not modeling uh, some of those resources there in the 2040s. Um, the chart here shows wind showing up later, I guess, in the 2030s. Um, in the modeling, though, is is wind allowed and other the other resources that you highlighted, wind, solar batteries, the CTs, reciprocating engines, are those all allowed to be selected in the model immediately in the first year or is there some any sort of delay that's incorporated in the modeling for those resources? The answer is yes. Now we do have assumptions around what's the construction timeline of these resources, but um, the answer to that question is yes. As soon as you know, we take into consideration how long it would take to build from you know the time that we finalize the IRP or, or from the time we actually make the decision to transact on the resource or to invest in the resource. So the, um, the the model takes into account the the construction time and then time for regulatory approval, um, but uh, but uh, as soon as the technology, as soon as we can get uh, um, build the technology, that's that's when it's reflected. And then, are are there any caps on the amount of, or the quantity of those resources being added in the model? Are you, for instance, only allowing the model to select like a thousand megawatts of solar each year? or wind 500 megawatts each year? Are, are there any sorts of caps on the technology additions by the model? I would defer to Daniel on that one. Yeah, I'll make sure with the, with the folks on, on the phone, if there are you can hear it too. Um, we haven't made decisions on that. I think our you know preference would be not to limit them. Um, you do have to consider if the model output is something that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, We'll sure. have to talk about that in terms of execution feasibility, but we don't plan to, to currently to place limits on that. Okay, thanks. Anything else? 
All right, well, thank y'all. It's good to be in Mississippi. Okay. Um, and so we thought we'd include a final slide on the timeline. I know there's been questions about that before. And it is in section 105 of the rule, but we thought we'd, we'd just try to be helpful and provide some dates. So obviously these are our calculations. Um, but uh, following this public workshop, there's a 25-day period for uh, comments. And so we calculate that as... Um, September 5th, taking the Labor Day holiday into account. And so we welcome your comments. We hope that you will take the opportunity to uh, submit those so that we can uh, incorporate them into our IRP process that will then take place um, up until the point when we will have a technical workshop. And so that follows the next section of the rule. Uh, 105.3 discusses the technical um, conference. We have available the exact same version of our non-disclosure agreement as last year, or sorry, last cycle. It's unchanged, uh, except that replacing it just, instead of saying 2021 IRP cycle, it'll say 2024 IRP cycle. So um, I can provide that to the commission. You can contact us directly just to get a new signed copy. Um, the rule does contemplate having a signed NDA to be able to participate in the technical conference, and I want to make sure that there are no limitations for anybody who wants to participate in that and receive all the confidential information that they um, need to to be able to meaningfully participate in that. Uh, some of the questions that were asked today um, will be able to be answered in much more detail at that conference. So the difference, you know, in the rule between today and that te technical conference is... Um, is that we'll go into much more detail about the inputs that, that are in the IRP at that technical conference. And then uh, we'll be filing the IRP by August 15th, 2024. And then we've also got um, on that timeline just some of our internal um, things that are happening, just so you're aware of what's happening. Um, we really appreciate um, the commission and, and some of you who received our notice of IRP cycle to move this uh, process out a couple of months so that we could use um, an internal um, assumptions base that was an entirely, um, an entire year of, of more updated assumptions that was responsive to uh, the commission and some of the stakeholders' request from the last cycle to have more updated data and inputs in our IRP. That was something that I think we discussed a lot at the technical conference last year. And so to be able to respond to that, we are um, grateful for um, your, your working with us on that. So that's what we expect to be able to, to use. It's also one of the reasons we didn't have some of those inputs for you today, you know, like Daniel and, and others discussed, those are still being developed internally. So we're doing the best we can with this process. Obviously, resource planning is just a dynamic process where we're always um, figuring out what makes the most sense for for customers to um, meet their needs. Do you have anything else you want to say, Aaron? Um, I just want to thank the, the audience for being here and, uh, and our other uh, guest speakers here that, that helped me out, and especially uh, Commissioner Brent Bailey here for, um, for, for hosting us here and, and part the participation. So... Uh, Commissioner Bailey. So your technical conference that you mentioned, that's the one that's uh, July next year? Or is it another one between? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. That's awesome. Make sure. Um, or it would be, I think it would be in June. Is that right? The, um, what is the word? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no later than um, okay. July 1st. It's got to be at least 45 days but. Um, before we file the IRP, right, no later, then. and we'll work with the commission to make sure that that's a good date for uh, any commissioners or commission staff that want to participate, and um, and make sure that we're able to provide materials um, as far in advance of that as we're able to. Um, I know that that's important, especially with the technical conference. Um, I know that's something we talked about, Simon, before this, um, and that was something that was in the commission's order. Um, last time, there's not like a prescribed number of days to provide materials, but we, we do want to give you a meaningful opportunity to review materials, and since it's the technical conference, there'll be more detail. So uh, we will work with, um, 
with anyone who signs that confidentiality agreement to make sure that they have um, some time to look over materials before the technical conference so that we can have some good uh, back and forth during that conference. Well, probably not to, I certainly don't want to back us up, but just kind of a question going ahead to slide 19 on risk assessments. I don't know. Oh. Can, can we go back or are we done? <laughs> and this may be a Jonathan or Daniel question, not sure, just, but on region reliability. Um, you know, how do the regional requirements and, and the matters uh, that are within the MISO area, particularly from what we're a part of, you know, how it plays into the uh, model development. How granular does EML plan to go in considering what your sister opcos are doing as well as other utilities within the region? As far as their IRPs or long-range plans, are you going to fall back on MISO and their um, their regional studies and plans, or are there other means y'all do to evaluate load profiles, generation plans of other utilities, and how that may play into your decision making as well? Gotcha. And it, it'll be a two-part. It'll be a two-part answer here because um, the we do participate in MISO with all of those studies and open stakeholder processes and learn a lot of information from others that we, uh, we're neighbors with. And a, a lot of the transmission um, style uh, processes here are covered in our, the EDP that we file as part of this overall uh, plan, but that's filed yearly here with the T&D plan when we have upgrades for transmission projects or, or even go more in depth with our distribution um, energy efficiency programs too. You know, but as far as the modeling in the IRP process, Daniel probably could, could answer if you want to. Sure. So in terms of the assumptions for neighboring utilities, for example, in the region, um, when we update the main kind of database that we get from our software vendor, it includes updated you know, load forecast assessments, uh, at least in terms of, um, you know, the Eastern Interconnect wide database. And there's a, a MISO portion of that. And there's data sources for non-MISO entities as well. Um, but for the MISO portion, you know, they have uh, Purdue produce a, a forecast every year, looks at the data that's submitted to MISO by load serving entities. And there's a projection of how that changes out in the future. So we capture some of that. And if there's IRPs or other, um, you know, public information, for example, for other utilities, uh, that is, that data is, you know, gathered and scraped together in terms of the, um, the sources that inform the database update as well. And we also have our own internal process where we take a look at the MISO market, um, usually using tools like S&P for trying to look at the, their database, which is looking at EIA and FERC filings and IRPs as well. They have a research team. So we're doing a, a wide kind of casting a wide net to try to make sure we're capturing public information about known changes to load and generation resources for other utilities, yeah, but in MISO. No, I'm, I'm, no I'm, I'm good. I appreciate appreciate the answer there, and thanks, everybody, for participating. You're going to now review questions from... Okay. We have no questions in the email inbox. I feel very unpopular. <laughs> okay. Well, again, thank you for your participation. Again, I want to thank, thank you all for, for joining us and, and look forward to working through this process with you all. So, hotty toddy, uh, hell state <laughs> to, to the top, all the above.